two guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. It is a Scoop Tuesday here on Minnesota Sports with Mackie and Judd. Our friend Darren Doogie Wilson from the 5 Eyewitness News Sports Department is here. Thank you. Thank you. you. Real quick, since Judd was... Judd was at U.S. Bank Stadium on Sunday for the game, and then he was at the Vikings practice facility yesterday and was uh, was unable to bring his flag because, you know, you're not supposed to, as a working member of the media, you're right. not supposed you to wear no, face can't, paint can't and wave that. a Vikings flag. So 2-0, and Vikings beat the 49ers. Get the flag. There it is. Oh, we will do it on Purple Daily as well. There you go. All right, everybody, you happy now? Get those labrums warmed up here. O'Connell, Zolgad, all very happy about this. Dukes 2-0. I see the Vikings have jumped up into or on the fringes of everyone's top 10 power rankings that I've seen so far today. Um, Just your your overall thoughts on a pretty, like, as good as you can get start to the season here for the Vikings. Absolutely. First 2-0 start in eight years. We have to go back to 2016 since we've seen a 2-0 start. I'll be the first to admit, I did not see Sunday coming. I was reminded, watching on Sunday, the master class that Kevin O'Connell and Brian Flores are capable of putting on. Heck, I was reminded last night. That was coaching malpractice by Nick Sirianni. To me, to not go for it on fourth down. Saquon Barkley drops that pass on third down. I was okay with the play call. Although Saquon has a history of dropping a lot of passes, I was okay. Although I would have gone run on third down, like a tush push, then gone for it on fourth down. Agreed. I think you get the three yards, you win the game. If you don't, Atlanta still needs to march many, many yards run to clock. get into field goal range to tie the game. If they had, you still could have won the game in overtime. So settling for the field goal to go up. Six, I'm telling you, bad, bad mistake. I'm and just doogie, doogie, watching well, the KOC is really, really good. Let me add this, too. This is a theory that we talked about years ago with you were part of it. Chris Long and I sort of like we started talking about this on a podcast one time, like nine years ago that. And I think there's some statistical evidence to back this up that you'd rather have a three point lead than a six point lead if you're a defense in the final two minutes, because. The team on offense plays conservatively, knowing that they okay. We're in field goal range. We don't want to blow the field goal here, so let's let's calm down a little bit. When they're down six, it's an all-out scramble to score a touchdown. So that factored on top too. Now the offense knows exactly what they have to do. Just an epic screw up on all fronts by Philadelphia down the stretch there. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Kevin O'Connell hasn't been put in a ton of those situations, but um, Nick Sirianni probably going to be looking for a job, I would think, in 2025. Yeah, I mean, at this rate, absolutely. And, Phil, you look at the landscape of the NFC, it's pretty crazy. Think about all the prognosticating we did in August. How much have those opinions changed based on these first two weeks? Like, what did you think of the Niners? What did you think of the Lions? What did you think of the Cowboys? What did you think of the Eagles. So maybe perhaps this conference is a bit more wide open than a lot of us thought. Also the defense, we touched on the defense plenty, July, August, even predating July, but we are seeing what we thought come to fruition that this defense should be a top 10 defense last year, top 15 in points against, but we're bottom 15, bottom half the league. Yards given up, turnovers created. By the way, 13th last year in points given up. Maintain health. They should be top 10 in all three of those areas, even though the Niners did get a big chunk of yards on Sunday. And that's the most important thing. Like, the Rams two weeks in are decimated. Like, like you, And you're going to get guys hurt. You're going to miss guys. The question is, how many guys are you going to get hurt at the same time? How long are they out, right? Be, because... That's the thing that you can't predict. And you know that more guys are going to get hurt. But if Justin Jefferson now comes back on Sunday, right? Probably playing at, let's just ballpark it, 85%. 
it's not perfect, but you're not missing him completely. Like there's so many things we spend all of, and, and it's fun, but we spend all of this time in the summer trying to predict things, but everything's always based on complete health. And this league, it has nothing, like if you look at the guys hurt around this league right now, including Jefferson, Addison, this league has nothing to do with that. So it's a combination, I think, of good coaching, good players, and just flat out luck. But I will say this, where I'm going to give, a, aside from the game on Sunday, and I asked O'Connell about this with you there on uh, Monday, Dukes, where I'm going to give O'Connell a ton of credit is he's done something in year three that he did not commit to until now. And that is the physicality, the depth of what they've built. And, and it's crazy too. But my point is, you know, 13 and four was fun, but it was also like, is this sustainable? And, and then ultimately they got to the Giants playoff game. It was not. Last year, it sort of went off the rails, was disappointing. Kirk got hurt. But if you look at how this team played on Sunday against the Niners, I think it was so much more impressive than the win against the Niners on Monday night last year. And from day one of training camp, Kwesi and O'Connell said, you know what? We need more depth and we have to get tougher. And they matched the 40 freaking Niners in physicality. That to me is, is a size, but it's a seismic change. We did not see that. No, we did not. It is a seismic change. I mean, that was thorough domination for large chunks of that game. I mean, if Aaron Jones, now, hey, Fred Warner, to me, Hall of Famer, he is that good. But if Aaron Jones scores that touchdown, you go up 27 to 7 against the vaunted San Francisco 49ers. Now, I get it. They score to make it 2014. You know, just over what, 10 minutes left. You're thinking maybe in that moment, if the Niners can force a three and out, so, hey, great job by Sam Darnold. I mean, you go back and watch that throw to Jalen Naylor. How pretty was that throw on that third down, converting three third downs on that nearly seven-minute drive to get the field goal to go up two scores? But I get it. Maybe there was some uncertainty at 2014, but you talk about the physicality. Phil, you probably know the numbers top of your head, but, like, how many times was Sam pressured on Sunday? It was minimal. Nine it's nine out of one. 31 dropbacks. Got to him. Okay, there you go. I knew you'd have it. Nine out of 31. So good job by the offensive line. Think about Ty Chandler, the way he ran, and just the pressure they were able to put on Brock Purdy as well. And so, yes, you talk about the physicality, you know, the cliche, winning the game in the trenches. You'll hear that a lot with the Gophers this week, right, when talking about Saturday against Iowa. They will point to that. Year after year, look at who wins the game in the trenches. That's who wins uh, Floyd of Rosedale. We're seeing that come to fruition now with the Vikings winning the game, if you want to use that cliche, in the trenches. So um, I'm going to ask you, you you, you kind of touched on the volatility of the NFC right now. So I'm going to put Doogie on the spot, and then you guys go ahead and answer too. After watching the first two weeks and seeing some of the injuries, like the, the Rams 0-2 decimated, That's a team that you thought was going to be in the mix for a deep playoff run. Packers lose Jordan Love. Now they ran, they they came back and just ran the ball 53 times on the Colts. I don't know how sustainable that is. So they're down a starting quarterback. The Lions lost a game at home, right? Eagles looked very pedestrian to me in both weeks one and two. Dallas's defense just gave up 40 plus at home. Vikings just beat the Niners. How many teams in the NFC after the first two weeks? are definitively better than the Vikings from what you've seen? I mean, I think there's still a few, right? I mean, it would be hard to not suggest New Orleans. And I get it. One of the wins was against lowly Carolina. But when you go into Dallas, win like that, score over the stretch of two games, 15 consecutive possessions, okay, New Orleans deserves all sorts of love. I still think Detroit is pretty good. Good. I didn't necessarily love what I saw week one, that Sunday night game against the Rams. Dan Campbell had some clock snafus on Sunday against a good Tampa team. And so I think we need to put Tampa in this conversation. I still think the Niners long term are in this conversation. But it's an interesting question, Phil. It absolutely is. And you look at the landscape of the schedule moving forward. Will Jordan Love be back? For week four, Ian Rappaport on Sunday suggesting more like week five. 
to be determined, but Jordan Love may not play week four. That game in London against the Jets, the Jets look horrific. Dude. Lose Eden Prairie's Jermaine Johnson for the season. They are not generating a pass rush. Drama with Hassan Reddick. That game, maybe two months ago, looked like it would be tough. Maybe not so much anymore. Okay, bye. Detroit at home. So you have that bye week to prepare for Detroit. That will be a fun one on October 20th. Short week, but Judd, you said it. The Rams are completely decimated. We see it year in and year out. It's usually a couple teams just are completely screwed by injuries. They are down three starting offensive linemen, their top two wide receivers, and a good safety. And I might be leaving out one or two key injuries, but minimum down those six players. That game on October 24th now looks easier. Not suggesting it's a layup, a for sure win, but I'm just saying, you know, you think about short week, having to travel, all that, maybe not as difficult as we thought a few weeks ago. Games against the Titans, the Jaguars, the Colts, maybe not as tough as we thought. All we can do, he's, Phil, he's young quarterback, is evaluate man, what we've seen, right? right. All we can right. do is base these opinions on the first two weeks. Based on the first two weeks, this really tough Viking schedule just doesn't look as tough anymore. I think you got to get past Detroit just because they are a good team. Here's But here's my point. Answer this question. In the NFC, name me a better coaching tandem than O'Connell and Flores because, to me, that's that's a, a key here. They built Sirianni depth, Fangio? And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like like Shanahan, he just beat him. So, Matt Eberflus and, and uh, yeah. the, that that uh, that now, guy who calls plays. Now I will caution uh, to, to go back to the fact that guys are inevitably going to get hurt. I will caution everyone with this. I love the Viking style. I applaud it. I think it's awesome. They're going to get guys hurt. Like like this this style will get more guys hurt than their previous style. Some some of it's fluky, but I mean. Debo Samuel gets hurt for a reason. Debo Samuel gets hurt because the Niners play a style that leads to that. Now, the question is, can you not have the fluke things, right? Like, can can Darnold not drop back to pass and his Achilles explodes? That's a fluky, weird thing. Uh, but this style, when you, when you see this employed consistently, it takes a huge toll. And that's where, the, where O'Connell's messaging is key. Because, like, you want to play this every week, this style of play. It's not a, like, choice thing. And this is where, like, time off and practice becomes key. Like, this is going to be a balancing act, but I still applaud it completely because I do think that it's the right path to take. Real quick, on the injury front, I mean, let's not dismiss the fact that I don't know how many teams besides the Rams are down against a team like San Francisco, down one of the best tight ends in the NFL and, a, like, one of the top five or six number two True. receivers in the NFL. Yep. So even even without the... And then Jefferson doesn't play in the fourth quarter where you have to score. So, yeah, like, you want to prevent against more injuries and, and lingering injuries, but the fact that they withstood major injuries on offense going into that game and still were up almost by three touchdowns in the second half, if not for a fumble on the goal line, is... Pretty incredible. Dukes, it is. they've got depth, though. Like, like that's the thing is. They have the enough. Snap so far. They've got enough depth. Yes, they do. Maybe more so on offense, but we'll continue to see. Like, they are going to give guys days off. Like, we saw it last Wednesday, Andrew Van Ginkle. We saw it week one, Harrison Smith, Stephon Gilmore, especially Smith and Gilmore. You'll continue to see those guys get some rest days, but certainly Van Ginkle, some others – as well. But like I think about how violent the defense is. Like they swarm. They really do. They play their ass off. They do. There are multiple well. guys around, you know, runners and and you know, getting in on tackles and and multiple tacklers right there like I think about a guy like Blake Cashman, right? One of my guys. Known Blake for a really long time. I know how excellent a player he is. We saw it on Sunday. Look at his injury history. Jets Texans. Can Blake Cashman play yep. 17 games? I think about him just about, you know, as much as anyone when you bring that up. I think, too, that, that in addition to like a personnel that fits Flores' a scheme and definitely more depth on defense, the unsung thing here is how many football PhDs do you now have player-wise on that side of 
the ball. Metellus, Smith, but I mean, Cashman. Cashman is making calls in his first year in a defense that is basically positionless. Like, that's not a – that's a smart guy. So, he like, is. it's – Yeah, it's I mean, you talk to Mike Grant going back to Eden Prairie. Yes, yeah. There's smarts there, yes. But, Duke, it's such an interesting combination of Flores wants to get players who are probably slightly crazed. Like, they swarm the ball, they hit guys, but at the same time, they have to be incredibly intelligent because if they're not, they're not going to know what to do. Correct. I'll give you two more. Harrison Phillips, incredibly intelligent. Cam Bynum Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And that's why, yeah, maybe you don't want to invest a ton of money in a safety, but I'd like to see Cam Bynum here beyond this year. There's been enough dialogue on a contract extension, but it was always a tricky one to get to the finish line before kickoff week one. So certainly all signs point to him getting the unrestricted free agency in March. You're not using the franchise tag on Cam Bynum, but I'd like to find a way to bring him back. It might be a little unrealistic, even with all the cap space the Vikings have, just because you're not going to invest that heavily in that position. But I'm telling you, Cam Bynum, incredibly smart. And you know what's uh, just to bring this kind of full circle from the beginning of of the episode last night, as you guys can imagine, maybe Judd saw some of this. My timeline was full after the Monday Night Football ended. Was full of ha ha, ah, oh, score North and Mackie and Judd must be crying in their beer tonight. Old Kirky boy, Potter four. Old Kirky boy, proving you wrong. Look, whatever you know, whatever. But it's but. You know, my response to that would be like, of course, like no one's doubting whether Kirk is a, well, I think there's some doubt 36 Achilles week one and short term. He proved on that final drive, he can still sling it. He, if you give him some time and some open receivers, he can navigate a drive, but it's the Vikings that are proving that paying a quarterback who can't carry your franchise for years and years, can't make up for roster deficiencies beyond like nine wins that that's, that's the problematic strategy, and the Vikings are showing you in the first two weeks. And now, anything can happen. Maybe Darnold goes off the rails, injuries, whatever, but they're showing you you can get cheaper at quarterback and maybe even on paper lesser at quarterback in terms of like resume and statistics, but guess what? You get to add Cashman. You get to add Van Ginkle. And I don't know how the math would have played out, but they wouldn't have been able to add as many of those guys, Aaron Jones, if they had agreed to a 40 or $50 million deal with Kirk Cousins. So what would you rather have, Kirk and say goodbye to like two or three of those free agent players I just mentioned, or Sam and more depth on defense where you're literally running out 17 guys in your defensive rotation right now and Aaron Jones along with Ty Chandler? Yeah, I mean, Jonathan Grenard, a top that list and hey he's been really good pressuring the quarterback eventually here he'll get a sack or two I mean that was always the idea it wasn't necessarily Sam although there was certainly steam on Sam you know pre you know March 11th the start of a free agency you know late January combine time you know into February I mean there was certainly steam but the idea was some rookie quarterback right a quarterback on a rookie deal to make these sorts of investments. I'm going back to in the NFC, is there a better tandem than KOC and Flores? It's hard. Well, well, it really I mean, Dan, is. Now, Dan, I mean, Cam- Dan Campbell and elite. Detroit. Dan Campbell, Ben Johnson, that combination. Is it still Glenn as the DC there in Detroit? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, All right, so but, you put them up there for sure. Okay. Who's Seattle's new OC? Did they get the guy from the Washington Huskies? Boy, I don't know who their new OC is, but they're off to a good two and zero start. You know, they've got young, fast players on defense. They got three, three good receivers. I mean, who have they beaten? But right, you think about. It, I just I like Mike McDonald a lot, right? But he's not above these guys. So I mean, put it this way: KOC, Flores, that combination, Judd, they're right in the mix, right? If oh, they're yeah. not one, yeah. if you want to put Detroit one, fine. McCarthy but they're right Zimmer? up there. That combination in the NFC. McCarthy Zimmer. Oh yeah, that's great. That's that's one of the great te- That's one of the great tandems, or it, it was for at least one week. Well, you know res- the- resume wise, I mean, those guys have the best resume of any tandem, but it didn't go well on Sunday against yeah, the Saints I, at home. I, I mean, I like what Washington is doing. It'll take a little time to build it. And hey, yeah, maybe they're not. Kingsbury isn't even there anymore. 
But the combination of Dan Quinn, Cliff Kingsbury, I think has a chance maybe a year from now if we have this conversation to at least be sort of in the mix. But right now, KOC Flores, certainly near the top, if not at the top. I think where the Vikings get credit here, though, you you guys, is this. If you sort of take a couple steps back from the statement itself, what the Vikings have done is, and I've talked about this occasionally before, but you didn't hire Kevin O'Connell to maintain a status quo quarterback. Like, Kirk Cousins was brought here because Zimmer didn't really have a quarterback, and he sure as hell, as we learned, wasn't going to develop one post-Teddy who broke his heart, right? So, like, there was a reason why you bring in Kirk. Now, it didn't work, but I but I got it at the time. And if you go back, I applauded it because I'm like, this guy doesn't have a quarterback. And all of us knew that Keenum was a one-year blip. But when you go and get O'Connell, which I think is an incredibly smart move because in 2024, I want a quarterback coach who is my head coach. When you go get him, this is the blueprint, right? Be- be- because if if Sam Darnold had gone back, like, if yesterday, if Dave Canales, you know, announces Bryce Young is benched and we have re-signed Sam and he's starting for us and he's just, we're going to throw him out there on Sunday, right now it's a probable disaster. So, like, this was the whole thing. J.J. McCarthy. J.J. McCarthy could have gone a lot of places. I think everyone feels he's fortunate to come here because, again, hand in hand with O'Connell. So, like, this to me is such a bigger topic than than just, like, you know, well, this – if. We, we always assume this. If a quarterback succeeds, he's now good. Like, he's going to be good anywhere. Not necessarily the case. So, O'Connell doing a fantastic job. Cheaper, right? And then you can let Flores go grocery shopping. And now he goes out and he's like, I want one of those and one of those. To, to Phil's point, this edge room, this edge room, Daniil leaves if Kirk stays, and they might have gotten one guy. That's it. They're not going to get yeah. three guys. So no. like, this is the difference. Like the growth, like mm-hmm. the Vikings and, and credit, uh, credit to Quazy here. This credit is the to crazy here. Credit to Quazy. <laughs> yeah. You wascally wabbits over at the Vikings. <laughs> credit to Quazy on this. This is where like they move the chess pieces around and it all makes sense. It does. Heck, let's go all the way back to January of 2022. Thank you, Denver Broncos, for hiring Nathaniel Hackett, who the Vikings really liked. Oh, in the combination of Andrew Miller, Rob Brzezinski, Quasi Adolfo Mensa, the Wilfs, realizing, okay, Kevin O'Connell is legit. Okay, maybe didn't call plays in Los Angeles. We're still trying to figure out right. what his upside is as a coach, but there is lots of upside. So credit to all those gentlemen for realizing late January 2022 that Kevin O'Connell was the right hire. Yes, credit to those many men, many, many men, as the Vikings were dancing to in the locker room on Sunday. Uh, Dukes, we'll get to the rest of your scoop bag here in a second after we get into the Finch Home Solutions bag, Cody Finch's bag. Oh, yeah, yeah. He he loves two things. One, the purple. He loves this team. I'm sure he is extremely excited about the 2-0 start, and he loves – making sure that your home is safe. Any electrical issues that you might have, call Finch, schedule an appointment with Finch. That van is going to pull up in front of your house, and I'm telling you right now, I've used them. They are going to be fast, efficient, and courteous. I'm talking about small things. You you know what? If you have uh, an outlet that needs to be replaced, Finch there. If you need rewiring for your whole doggone house, guess what? Finch, right there. And right now, PD customers will get one free year of uh, Finch Friends and Family membership plan, which includes a 10% discount, priority dispatching, and one annual safety inspection. So again, take advantage. And if you have anything that you need fixed right now, just call them, 612-357-2604, or check them out, finchhomesolutions.com. Easy to navigate website, finchhomesolutions.com. Dukes, what else do you got in your scoop bag there? I mean, the, the Twins continue their free fall, just a game and a half up on the Tigers. But uh, take us take us through the rest of your scoop bag. Well, a couple more in the Vikings. I texted somebody with direct knowledge just saying, hey, based on that coaching master class on Sunday, it remains baffling how the Vikings have not extended Kevin O'Connell. This person texted back one word, agree. And I'm telling you, 
it's coming. It's just a little weird to me, based on what took place in Miami with Mike McDaniel, that it hasn't happened quite yet. And thinking about Sunday, so the Texans really didn't like try hard to re-sign Jonathan Grenard. They were looking at some other possibilities. Things happened fast. Hey, the Vikings tried on Brian Burns, didn't maybe go real far in those talks with Carolina, came to the realization, hey, we can just sign a really good player in free agency in Grenard. But on Blake Cashman, the aforementioned Blake Cashman, the Texans absolutely wanted him back. And hey, like Blake Barrett's locally based agent, there were a lot of options for Blake, including the week four opponent, the Green Bay Packers, plus some others. But good job by the Vikings winning that recruiting war in a very finite amount of time. Like Blake agreed to terms pretty quickly into free agency on the Twins, Phil. So 12 to go. Detroit comes back, wins last night. Bobby Wood Jr. hits a grand slam at Kaufman. You're thinking the Royals are going to run away with that thing. The Tigers come back, win the game. It's now a game and a half. But, Declan, you know this. The Twins have the tiebreaker. Barely. What was it? Seven to six in the regular season? Yeah. Just, Twins and them. Tigers. But thanks to the Twins winning one extra game against the Tigers, it's really a two and a half game lead. The Tigers still have a couple games against the Royals. Then go to Baltimore this weekend. I get it. The Tigers just won two against three of three against the Orioles at Comerica. But now they go to Baltimore. Then they finish at home against the Rays and the lowly White Sox. I still think, Phil, the Twins are relatively well positioned. I don't know, man. Trying to give myself a little leeway here. They're losing three or four this week, right? stumble into the sixth seed. Well, yeah, how many more games are they going to lose this week? I mean, you feel good about Pablo being on the mound at Fenway on, what would that be, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right. Saturday. So you feel good about Saturday's game. Bailey over on the mound tomorrow. I mean, that's the thing. Declan I mean, Cole Irvin? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Don't do that, Declan. And, hey, we've gone all in on, you know, lack of spending and all that. Derek Falvey did not have a good trade deadline. Like, if you knew, like, Michael Kopech was their guy. If you knew, based on Dylan Cease talks, other dialogue with the White Sox, that the White Sox are very much anti-trading in division, why did you spend so much time trying to acquire Michael Kopech? There yeah. were other relievers to get. That was the fail on July 30th. The other tale of the Falvey regime is to try and, and get out, like, significant names right like we try to sign we try to sign pitcher x but you know what the phillies beat you know beat us um there also were yeah, other although they like, did make zach wheeler a nice offer back in the sure day, but, but my point but they also but knew you, that zach was looking to play on the east coast so it's like right. one of those deals you make the offer but you knew zach was never but hold on a second dude hold wait 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 this is a situation where it also though was you weren't you needed to get some help reinforcements and so like Ryan being hurt, you knew that it would probably be a good idea to get a veteran starter. You didn't. You knew that it would definitely, 1,000%, no debate, help to get a southpaw in the bullpen. It doesn't need to be a name where we're all like, oh, I know that guy, and he's got three years left on his contract. So this is one, gentlemen, where I think the blame can just be spread around. I don't think we need to defend anyone. I really don't. I think the blame can be spread, and it starts like... Phil said on Tuesday or on Monday, it starts at the top. They slashed payroll. They did not replace Gray or eat or come close. But you're right too. It can't be like, well, the poll ads uh, cut payroll, and so Derek Falvey couldn't do anything. No, he could have done something. He could have. He had some. He weird. didn't. He did. So yeah, yep. I'm with you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we can spread it out. I just think there's too much blame being put on poll ad and. Let's just spread around. Yes, starts them. the poll ads, you know, Joe specifically, yes, deserve criticism, deserve blame. But let's not just fixate on that one area. And, yeah, I mean, heck, if you have a lefty you trust Declan last night, what are the chances that Griffin Jacks even starts that eighth inning facing Naylor? Then after Naylor gets the double, a couple batters later, Manzardo, like what are the chances – but that's even Griffin Jack's pitching right there. If you had any trust whatsoever in Caleb Theobar 
or you had acquired a different lefty. I, I, I mean, yeah, if they had, a, if they had a probably elite lefty, they would, but that's their best arm against, against a guy that hasn't played a lot. Like I'm, I'm trusting Griffin Jacks, get that out. Like it, 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 he gave up a shot, but you got to get the out. Yeah, absolutely. But how often has he, and I get it. What was it? Three pitches, four pitches, but mm-hmm. sits down then comes back. And Hey, you could argue Griffin, you're professional. You figure it out. But right. when's the last time the twins had Griffin do that? Mm-hmm. Declan. I just think they've done, it, they've done it a spot, couple times in the last a lot few ask. weeks. Yeah. I mean, but not very often, right? Where Griffin sits down, then comes back out. Just not something he's truly accustomed to. Yeah. On the lefty thing real yeah. quick, how on their 40 man roster. So 20, 26 expanded in the, you know, on the major league roster, but then you get basically a taxi squad of other players that are in your minor league system that you can just call upon and promote, right? So a 40-man roster in Major League Baseball, how many trustworthy left-handed pitchers are on it? Is it zero? Well, I mean, you don't trust Fieldbar, right? You don't trust Hedrick. Although Hedrick has looked okay for the Saints. That's a semi-intriguing name. I still like Cody Funderburk, but the numbers in St. Paul don't blow you away. And so, yeah, is the number zero? It might be zero. That's wild. I mean, that is like, that's a massive indictment to not have a singular lefty starter or reliever on your 40 man roster that you trust in a playoff run. Yeah. I mean, I mean, am I forgetting anybody, Declan? I mean, is no, it just the no, three no, that are on the 40 man? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Steven, right? Elkert. Steven Elkert went away. So, yeah, nope, that's, yeah, he's that's, away. That's, that's he's not on the 40 man. Long ways away, boys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and Hedrick is on the 40 man. I think so. It, it doesn't matter. It it, it truly doesn't is. matter. Yeah. <laughs> it, and it, that's, it, and he covers the team. Yeah, yeah. It truly doesn't matter. They it, for for a team that loves their splits and platoons, uh, they they do not have a, a trustworthy lefty. It's bad man. Dude, Did we you guys do, notice we... that Carlos Correa was wearing New Balance cleats last night? Yes, he was. Has been. Mm-hmm. Nerd. Since he came back and mm-hmm. dug it out like an archaeologist to make sure his heel is comfortable. Yeah, I'm telling you, there's more to that story. There's some stuff that oh, hasn't God. been told. I'm can't sure. That I can't wait till it comes out. Yeah, and it might be a while, but yeah. Although I'll tell yeah. you what, I mean, I know that Class A got him in the ninth, but the fact that he fouled off that one pitch, I'm thinking you've barely seen any live pitching oh, yeah. since July 12th. Yeah. That was actually pretty darn impressive Yeah, it was. last night. But I'm still thinking, you know, could he have been back sooner? Put it that way. Yeah. Uh, Dukes, we do have to run here, but it was great. Chopping it up with you on this Scoop Session Tuesday. A couple more notes. I was curious, so I checked. Has there been any sort of sense that the Twins want to re-sign Carlos Santana? Maybe eventually, but crickets. There just there hasn't been any, mm. at least external chatter on that front. But credit to Carlos, credit to Willie Castro, and I get it, Castro's numbers really since the All-Star break, since he played in the All-Star game. Yuck. But, hey, at least those two guys – are incredibly durable. And the Wolves did have some interest in Landry Shamit before he signed a non-guaranteed deal earlier this week with the New York Knicks. The Wolves did add a couple camp bodies in the last 24 hours. Skylar Mays, a point guard, being one of them. You know, those are Exhibit 9, Exhibit 10 type deals, non-guaranteed deals, just bringing some bodies into camp. But Shamit is a guy that legitimately could have won a job. The Wolves had interest, but he ultimately chose New York. Darren Doogie Wolfson from the Five Eyewitness News Sports Department. We'll do it again Thursday, Dukes. Great stuff, man. Okay, boys. Take it easy. See ya. All right, boys. Minnesota Sports with Mackie and Judd. A Scoop Tuesday here.